Welcome, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us today. My name is Chris Wren. I'm the chair of the XDS Advisory Committee. Welcome to our new podcast that allows you, the listener, to get to know our important contributors just that much better and provides you with different and perhaps an even better way to consume uh, the fantastic knowledge that we create through our XDS event. Um, for those of you who might be new to this, XDS stands for External Development Summit, an annual event delivered in Vancouver in the first week of September. It's the only event of its kind that focuses on the practice of external development by bringing together developers and service providers to facilitate B2B connections, share knowledge, foster a community, and advance the practice of external development for the games industry. Today, I am honored to have Dave Sanderson join me in studio. Dave is currently Director of External Development at Phoenix Labs and a pillar of my XDS Advisory Committee. Dave, I mean every word of that. So if you wouldn't mind, sir, would you uh, would you enlighten us and, and introduce yourself to our listeners? Oh, sure. I don't know how I'm supposed to top uh, what was just said. But <laughs> um, yeah, as you say, my name is Dave. Um, I have been at Phoenix Labs for four and a half years now in external development. Um, before that, I was on the service provider side, uh, working primarily in trailers and cinematics. Um, at various points in my career, I have worked in narrative design, narrative development. I was in the film industry for about 10 years. Um, and if you go f enough back, I was in uh, executive headhunting for a while as okay. well. So it's kind of a, a, a many and varied background. But these days, I spend most of my time thinking about external development and risk analysis and all that kind of fun stuff. So, you know, congrats to you, Dave, for your uh, ascension at Phoenix Labs. I mean, that's really what it's been, you know, through the acquisition by uh, Garena. Correct. Am I saying Garina, that correctly? That's right. You know, all the growth and expansion that you have been supporting. Uh, and it's also been a real Vancouver success story that you've been a part of uh, for a long time now. Do you, by the way, Dave, do you recall um, who we have to thank for bringing us together? I'm taking you way back oh, here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, well, I'm, for you and I personally, I, I feel like you've got an anecdote that you're going to share. So I'm excited <laughs> to hear that. Um, my earliest connection to XDS is actually my very first day at a company called Goldtooth, where I worked before um, on that uh, trailer and cinematics. My very first day when I got offered the job there was... Um, during XDS. I didn't know that at the time, but they had just mentioned uh, that there was going to be a party at the studio that night, and it was the it was the studio crawl um, right. event, and so I uh, I wound up meeting a lot of the folks who are now my peers and have become very good professional friends um, on that very first day. So XDS, for me, is very closely tied to uh, um, my experience in the games industry, full stop. Um, but I'm very curious, about who brought us together? Well, first of all, we probably clinked glasses without probably, even knowing it yeah, at that, right. at that pub crawl party that you you guys hosted it was uh sam carlisle so oh, another member yeah. of our well, advisory committee who's yeah. like these two guys have to uh these two humans have to connect so sam if you're listening you're responsible for this all roads <laughs> whether you like it or not so thank you thank you for that so we're here today to talk a little bit about the fantastic presentation dave that you delivered uh at xds 2022 uh pivoting uh, XDEV strategies post-acquisition. Uh, before we break into this, I think it's really important that we recognize uh, the peer reviewer that helped you through this presentation, uh, Isabel Bismuth at uh, at Ubisoft. I don't know if you want to say a few words about uh, Isabel and her, her contribution. So... Um she and I were connected through the advisory committee, um, and I was delighted to be paired up with her. Um, you know, everybody who gets selected to give a presentation at XDS gets paired up with a, a peer reviewer, um, and I was very fortunate to be paired with her. Um, she and I had had very little to do with each other previously. Um, only, you know, we did direct it as members of the board, um, but on a professional basis, we hadn't had much of a chance to work together one-on-one, -on -one, and I... Any positive expectation I may have had going into it was was blown away by the reality. Um, she's just an incredibly insightful and thoughtful person who was very giving of her time. And, um, you know, the talk that you're about to hear is immeasurably improved by, by her contributions. There you go. So, Isabel, if you're listening, uh, thank you for for working, uh, working with Dave and being his partner uh, in crime through that process. So, I guess, touching on the theme of your talk, Dave, at, you know, Phoenix Labs, you went from, as you said, a 30-person company, you know, uh, and your team of one 
to where you are today. I mean, did you anticipate how that would change your external dev strategy, you know, going into that post-acquisition state? Or was there really just a lot of winging it and trial and error? I mean, I think that there's, it's sort of a, a, a bit of column A, bit of column B. I mean, you try and go into it with the, the best strategy you possibly can. And then, of course, you know, no, no strategy survives first contact with the enemy. So um, the reality of what was happening um, as our company grew and as our company was executing on the, the larger corporate strategy that we had, um, that had very real ramifications for me, for my team, and for how we approach external de- development in general. Um, the timing of the conversation you and I are having now um, is actually pretty um, interesting in the context of the talk that you know is going to follow this introduction. Um, when I gave that talk uh, in the fall at XDS, you know, Phoenix Labs was still on the path of growing within Garena, which itself is part of a larger um, publicly traded company called C Group. Um, but as you and I speak, we are just a few weeks past Phoenix Labs being taken private through a VC-backed management buyout. Okay. And uh, so it's funny, the in preparation for this conversation, you know, I was going back through my notes and back through that presentation, and so many of the thought processes that I outlined in that presentation, I am now doing yet again as the realities of my team and of my company have changed pretty significantly once more as we sort of have taken back our independence and our and our ability to kind of own our own destiny a little bit. So, um, but yeah, it's a uh, it is it is uh, an ever evolving time, and it's very very exciting. It's very very positive, and I'm just you know, my work is fun. I really, really enjoy it. And it it just keeps getting more and more interesting and more and more exciting. Right on. As it should be in our industry. Absolutely. In my opinion. Indeed. You know, watching back your presentation recently, Dave, uh, a really key point that you raised and you emphasized was on the subject of focus. So external development allowing developers to focus on what they do best. And I think in some cases, maybe not for all the veterans out there, but that might be something that occasionally gets lost on some service providers and the importance of of giving the the developer, their client, that focus. So do you think your partners genuinely understand that? Or is there anything that you can say to really like hit that point home? Sure. I think that um, our partners and folks in the industry in general understand it implicitly if not explicitly that the thing that they're doing um, is allowing more developers to focus on their best work and you know we all have the same number of hours in the day we all have time is a, you know an inflexible thing for everybody uh, and you know to quote Sean Bender who's one of the uh, one of the founders of Phoenix Labs and has been a real um, you know, mentor and and uh, source of wisdom for me in all of this. You know, he just, he talks about how focus is the most valuable thing we have, and so the degree to which we can get Phoenix Labs employees spending more time focusing on their best work, um, the better it is for everybody. The better our products are, the the more fun we're having, the more engaged our employees are, the more we'll retain them, the better our games will be, the better player experience we'll have. You know, all, all those all those kinds of things. So um, when we talk about is a service provider a good fit for us and our needs? Ultimately, what we're usually saying is, is this person or this company going to allow us to spend more time focusing on what we care most deeply about? And are we able to help them focus more of their time on things they care most deeply about? Um, And the the degree to which we can kind of optimize that equation is the degree to which it's successful. Is it, it is a successful partnership. So since you stepped off that stage in September and you wiped your brow and you thought, okay, pressure's off. I'm done. I mean, I'm sure you must have had people, you know, come up to you and give you feedback, ask clarifying questions. Um, you know, was there anything from the presentation that uh, feedback that you heard that uh, influenced a change in their thinking or I'm how not, they well, approached the, how I they approach their business or their external development? Certainly challenged their, th- their thinking for sure. I have, I mean, I had, um, I had a lot of really positive feedback and I'm really grateful for that for folks that have uh, taken the time to, to watch it and to think about it. Um, the most controversial piece of that presentation Um, was also the most controversial piece internally, which is a a part where I speak about um, whether or not external development is a good way to bridge staff shortages or, uh, and 
how much or little outsourcing is a viable way to grow uh, in the absence of an ability to hire people. Um, and one of the things that I'd said, as, you know, as folks will hear, is that that is an incredibly risky thing to do. Um, and for us, uh, that was judged at a sort of philosophical level as something we did not want to do. We never wanted to fix staffing shortages with outsourcing. Um, and, you know, I'll get into sort of the, the details of why I came to believe that and why I still believe that to be the case um, in the presentation. But it is um, one of the things that I think is really important and I hope people walk away from this talk thinking about is that there's no such thing as good outsourcing. There's no good, no such thing as good external development. There's no such thing as a best practice. There is good outsourcing, good external development, good best practices for the situation that you're in mm. and for the company that you're at and for the company goals that you have. So one of the reasons why I like my job so much and why I think this space is so interesting is that it is simultaneously a very um, strategic level role where you have a great picture of what's going on at the corporate level. You're very involved in finance, in legal. Uh, and so you have a picture of kind of like what's going on at the kind of 50,000 foot level. And it's also very tactical, where you are on the ground supporting people who have very real problems with their projects that they need to get solved. And so it's a very kind of like brass tacks ground level um, uh, role as well. So the, the power of external development, the power of folks in roles like ours, is the ability to translate between those two perspectives mm -hmm. and to make sure that the tactical decisions you're making align with the strategic level decisions that your, sort of your corporation has. So... Um, the reason why we made the kinds of calls that we made um, that I talked about in this presentation are entirely dependent on how well and how well described I understood our corporate goals to be. Like mm -hmm. XDEV is a really powerful way to advance corporate goals uh, and to align people. Um, and if my goals are different than your goals, then my best practices are not going to align with yours. Absolutely. And that's true for interpreting those goals internally, as well as how your external partner interprets those goals exactly. and manifests those goals. Yeah. Dave, any any uh, final parting words for uh, for our listeners before we, we move into your talk? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. And please, I, uh, I'm very findable on LinkedIn. I'm very noisy. Um, and please do, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me, contact me, talk to me. Um, I would love your thoughts and feedback. I, I could talk about this stuff all day. So please give me the opportunity to do so. Something tells me you might get a few more pings once this gets uh, <laughs> Hope so. released. Well, Dave, thank you again for all your contributions in XDS from you know being a, a valued advisory committee member to delivering this talk. May it not be your last one. And without further ado, uh, let's get into Dave Sanderson's uh, XDS 2022 talk, uh, Pivoting to Changing External Development Strategies Post-Acquisition. I'm Dave Sanderson. I am the Senior External Development Manager at Phoenix Labs. Um, and before I get started, just a couple of things. Um, first, I wanted to make some acknowledgements first to Isabel and to Chris Wren for their invaluable support in um, making this talk happen and this conference happen. Um, to uh, Tori Matheson, to Glenn Barnes, to Jim Marie Owens, and to Lynn Williamson Christie for their contributions to this deck. Uh, and to Mike Reed, to Lauren Lee, and Phil Yi, the other members of the external development team at Phoenix Labs. So, uh, hard pivot post-acquisition strategy changes. Um, the reason why I wanted to give this talk is that M&As are all over the news. And it's a very hot button topic in our, in our industry. Um, but it feels like within all of that noise, there isn't actually a whole lot of signal about what is actually happening inside the studio. And I wanted to change that. Um, so I wanted to kind of arm people here with some information about how they can interpret uh, an M&A when they see it in the news and perhaps also guide some decision making um, if they themselves are going through it or perhaps if their clients are going through it. Um, and uh, one last thing, I, I wanted to uh, really make sure that this is a talk that is useful to folks. So my, my hope here is that there's going to be some Q&A at the end of it and we can kind of get into some, some gory details. So uh, with that said, let's, uh, let's get started. So I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, could be significantly less. As you may notice, I, uh, I speak quite quickly. Um, I am relying on my colleagues in the front row to yell at me if it gets so fast that uh, you can't understand what I'm saying. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the, the story of Phoenix Labs and how we got to acquisition, um, what meaningfully changed afterward and how our goals changed, um, and then really 
what, how we think about um, a new strategy to reflect those new goals and kind of the, the, the first principles of how to think about XF strategy, um, a little bit of time on what BAB looks like, what not to do, uh, and then finally kind of get into some gritty details about we, how we actually went through the pivot. So starting out, road to acquisition. Um, where did this talk come from? Well, this talk actually begins before I joined Phoenix Labs. I actually got to know the, uh, the folks at Phoenix Labs um, as a service provider uh, before joining the team to help run outsourcing. Uh, and so there is Phoenix Labs not long after I joined. If you actually look on the bottom right there, that's me kneeling down. Um, when I joined Phoenix Labs, there were about 70 people. This is just shortly after Dauntless launched. We have one flagship title right now. Dauntless, it's a action RPG co-op game, cross-play, cross-platform. Uh, came out a couple of years ago. And uh, it's on Nintendo Switch and PlayStation and Xbox and PC. And it did very well for us. It was a, a very successful launch. And this was a, a huge achievement for a small team, um, which is really one of the things that uh, was a founding idea for Phoenix Labs. Uh, two core th thoughts. The first is that a small, highly effective team can do the work of many more. Uh, in its original conception, Phoenix Labs was never supposed to be more than 30 people. Um, we just passed 300, so uh, kind of failed pretty hard on that front. Um, but when we started so small, that actually assumes an enormous amount of reliance on external partners. So when you think about how Phoenix Labs operates, outsourcing was always a big part of how we were going to come together. Um, a second piece that really matters here is that Phoenix Labs was founded by people who wanted to have a company where they could retire. And they wanted to build a company where people could come and do the best work of their careers, and if they so choose, to retire there. And what that means is that stability was hugely prioritized. We wanted to be a highly employee-focused business. And so one of the ways that you can deliver on stability and flexibility and being highly effective as a small team is external development. So when I arrived, uh, this was, uh, well, when I arrived, there was no formal strategy around outsourcing. We were pretty good at it. A guy named Glenn Barnes was already running it. A guy named Nick Clifford, not so much so. Um, and uh, which he will appreciate in the recording of this, I'm sure. But one of the things like, when I came to Phoenix Labs was codifying um, our external development strategy. So there's a few things here. First of all, you know, we're trying to build a, a AAA quality free to play MMO with a small team. Uh, we have very high quality goals for our products. Second is to really allow folks to focus on their best work by outsourcing some repetitive or less desirable tasks. Um, if we want to be world class in something, build it internally. If we can't, find out who is and work with them. And finally, to prioritize long-term relationships. So if you read between the lines here, you can actually see how this strategy speaks to the business realities of how Phoenix Labs operated as a young company. For example, we were really conscious about headcount, very making sure to grow at a very measured pace and really invest in our company culture and protect our recruiting process to make sure the kinds of folks that are joining the team are folks that we'd want to be joining the team. Um, there's also, we're very employee focused. You can see here that like one of the ways that we can use external development is to help folks really do the work that they care about uh, and building a company where people can find a home. And finally, you can see that quality and stability are top priorities. So, and this strategy served us really well. Um, one of the ways you can tell this strategy happened really, or served us well, is that in 2020, uh, this happened. Phoenix Labs was acquired by a company called Garena. Um, and Garena is a uh, Southeast Asian-based gaming division of a much larger uh, Singapore-based technology company called C Group. And I would be surprised if many more than a handful of people have heard of Garena in this room, um, which is an interesting surprise because they support 600 million active players. They are an enormous company uh, that, uh, with enormous achievement, um, most notably a game called Free Fire. It was the most downloaded game on the App Store this year and last year and the year before that. Um, and they share our company values in a very deep way. They are incredibly player focused, they're incredibly employee focused, and they're a great team. Um, they're actually uh, a, a, one of the earliest investors in Phoenix Labs, so this was not the case of some other company coming from overseas. These were people that we knew uh, and that really believed in us from the beginning, and so this was really an evolution of a partnership. From a more strategic perspective, uh, Garena is extremely strong on the mobile side and have deep expertise in developing markets in Asia, whereas Phoenix Labs is much more um, console and PC-based AAA developers with a lot of expertise in North America and Europe. So you can see sort of a natural synergy between those two things um, that we filled a real kind of uh, expertise gap, uh, and we were a strong investment as, as uh, Garena sought to um, bring games to more people around the world. So. Uh, why does this matter for XDev and why does this matter for this talk? Well, um, that strategy that I just showed you um, didn't serve us so well anymore. And why that's the case is kind of the, the meat of this talk. Um, but I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here and show you what our XDev strategy ultimately wound up being after, uh, after a review process. And then we're going to talk about why we got to the place that we got to. 
Um, so post-acquisition, our strategy ultimately looked like this. So this is all about our team readying for scale. We're supporting and accelerating the development of a slate of AAA games, still allowing people to focus on the work that helps, them, uh, helps the company grow and makes our, and makes our business better. Um, we wanted to scale our network of partnerships, but also leverage uh, C Group and Garena where appropriate to do so, and build a pipeline to help manage our vendors. So on, at first glance, this doesn't look that different. You know, we're making a slate of games instead of a single game. We want to help folks focus and grow while also improving our business. We want to leverage, leverage the benefits of being a large multinational company, and we wanted to build a scalable system for partners. So no big deal, nothing controversial there. Except uh, this strategy, as written here, represents a, a sea change in how we operated as a business, not just external development, but for legal, for operations, for finance, for basically any discipline that can be outsourced. This led our team to slash our external development budget, terminate contracts with uh, some of our longest term partners. Uh, and it also led uh, me to grow my team from one to four people. And how all of that came to be uh, is what I'd like to tell you about. So, but why? Why did we make these decisions? And why does something that seems fairly minor on paper actually show up in the world as a really dramatic shift? So, uh, I want to talk about sort of the new reality uh, and what became true at Phoenix Labs as a result of becoming part of Garena and really that shift in, in importance. And the, the thing to take away from this section is that like, when a company's goals change, external development has to change along with it and to understand those goals. It's critical that you come to understand what your company is trying to achieve. So how we work with external teams needed to change. First of those is that we were no longer a small and independent studio. Phoenix Labs was originally a tiny business based in Vancouver that was venture capital backed. We eventually had a, a, a team in San Francisco, uh, but still, we were still in a, from any reasonable scale of people attending this conference, we were a small, we were a small company uh, with big ambitions. Um, but this is the thing, now we are part of a business where we were an investment. We were a place of expertise where another company had come to us and said, you are the experts in console development, you are the experts in Western markets, help us grow and do what you wanted to do. Do what you wanted to do all along. But instead of going from one game and starting to think about the second game, what if you could grab hold of any of your dreams right now? What would you do if you could? And I need to really stress this. The, the new scale was really more about new opportunities. And it was incredible for us because not only is this about a, a matter of we now have money to do more things, this was a group of people who, had, who believed in us, who wanted to say, what is it you think you should do? How can we empower you to do it? This is an incredibly high trust partnership and we we're just absolutely thrilled to do it. And I will say in the years that we've been working with people from Greena, they are nothing but lovely folks and we're delighted with this partnership. Um, and then also admit that I really wanted to do a good job when it came to revisiting our XDev strategy. These are people that I trusted and wanted to deliver for. And finally, this is a really important part. Uh, acknowledging that where we came from and our future were going to be different places. Uh, this is not about sort of calcifying what you did before. Uh, this is much more about looking at the future and being willing to drop what maybe you're used to in favor of things that unlock your growth. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? So here's that, uh, that original strategy again. And I want to dig into two things in particular um, to kind of dial in what I'm talking about. The first of these, let's focus on uh, building a AAA quality MMO with as small as team possible. Well, that's not true anymore, right? So smallest team possible here is super meaningful. A small team is what allows us to be lean and efficient, which is especially important in a venture capital backed space. Um, but it also tells you a lot about how we work with partners. If you're a tiny team with a big game, you have to rely on your external partners to take on big, meaty, meaningful chunks of your work. You have to assume that there's, there's things that you cannot do and you have to trust other people are gonna get it done. That tells you a lot about our due diligence process and it also tells you about the kinds of relationships we wanted to foster, which is also why you see we care about long-term relationships. Um, also, the second one, if you can't be world-class in something internally, find out who is and do it with them externally. Well. What if we could be a uh, world class in something internally that we aren't currently? How do you decide what to invest in? How do you decide what are the right things to pour a lot of money and time and effort into so that you do become world class? And what are the things that should stay with external development? What's the framework where you make those kinds of decisions? And so how we work with external development teams needed to change. 
And why exactly is that changing? Well, a few things. One, what counts as tolerable risk had changed. It's really important to remember that external development is a really powerful way to manage risk inside a company, uh, whether that's sort of production risk in terms of uh, your ability to create a certain number of assets within a certain time frame. It also relates to business risk, where like the cost of development is spread across more teams. And you've got more people have kind of skin in the game. Um, and you can do things like not grow too fast, right? It's, it's, a, it's a way to control risk. Also, our ability to invest in ourselves had meaningfully changed. Before, in Phoenix Labs' history, every dollar that we spent was money that came from venture capital. We had to go ask investors for it, and every time we ran out of that money, we had to go raise another series. And those are non-trivial things to do. They're hugely time-consuming, and they also put you one more step away from becoming a profitable business yourself. Now, there's lots of good, there's lots of good reasons to do it, um, but it is a thing that you have to keep in mind. And finally, our scale and our ambitions had changed. We suddenly had access to people with expertise that we had no knowledge of before who were ready to help us. So this is both from a technology standpoint inside C Group, this is from a publishing standpoint inside Garena, and this also meant that like, if you wanted to build a slate of games, how would you go about doing it? You have the money. What are you going to go do with that? How do you make those decisions? So our external development strategy had to change. And that just leaves one question. One question, go for it, that one. What now? What comes next? So this put me in a position where I had to think about the way to solve external development problems. If I'm gonna decide what is a good thing to do with our new strategy, I gotta understand what kinds of problems external development is good at solving. If I know what's important to my business, I also need to know what my tools are good for. So from my perspective, External development is good for four main things. This makes it look nice, neat, and tidy. It's not, it's messy and gray, but this is a useful framework to, to go through it. The first of these is expertise. This is all about accessing skilled talent. Um, by and large, you would think about something like maybe a very specific engineering expertise or perhaps an elite level concept artist who's somewhere in the world. Um, so you're, you're getting access to something that you wouldn't otherwise have internally. Um, it's also really worth noting that XDev is a great way to access global perspectives if you're trying to build a product that's appealing to a global audience and you want to, you want to build more diverse perspectives, more diverse backgrounds into your development process. External development is a great way to do it. Next is flexibility. So the needs of a game developer fluctuate pretty dramatically sometimes, uh, and external development is a great way to manage that fluctuation. You know, our needs can also often be very spiky, and so outsourcing, good way to manage that. Finally, cost. Um, some services are just prohibitively expensive to maintain internally. A good example of that would be very few developers in the world need to maintain a trailer team internally. It does exist. But if you're trying to make photo real trailers, it's almost always better to go outside the studio um, or something like you know, localization, you know, t teams that is prohibitively expensive to maintain. Um, and it's also worth noting that this, this uh, bucket's a return on investment as well. Like, there are some markets where if you go there, you can get great work uh, and you can compare India to Malaysia to South Africa to the United States and you can judge between them and you can ban manage your return on investment. And finally, focus. This is actually the big one. Um, external development is a really powerful tool to free up developers' time. If you're able to outsource costs so they can focus on the thing that they are very best at, that is the most powerful thing that you can allow a developer to do, which is really important to know for people who are service providers here selling your services. If you are able to allow developers to focus better on the things they care about, that is where most of the value is coming from and what you do. It's not because you make a widget, it's because you allow them to do other problems. So uh, let's talk a little bit about investment and risk, especially post-acquisition, because this is really what we're talking about after Greener shows up and they have, they're, they're ready to invest in the company. We're, we have to start thinking about where XDev risk exists. So the first of these is Greenet invested in Phoenix Labs, not other businesses. And it's really important for folks uh, when they're looking at news in, around mergers and acquisition that what you're seeing happen is one business bring essentially a giant pile of money to another business and say, grow or achieve a certain goal. And any time that you are then working with service providers, you are effect you're effectively representing a choice. A choice to not spend that money inside your company, a choice to spend that money outside your company. 
So this is the thing we're talking about here. To invest in things that are not us building, our studio, our expertise, or our scale, that's a meaningful choice. And it's a choice that we're rightly questioned on from the people that are acquiring us. And finally, the most important thing we could do with Greta's resources was invest in Phoenix Labs. And this is actually the thing that governs most of the external development strategy uh, that you saw a, a, few a few moments ago with our sort of you know, ready for scale technology, or ready for scale strategy rather, um, is we are trying to make sure that we are doing the most with Garena's resources to invest inside our company. So this strategy and this acquisition is really a dividing line. The moment that Garena acquired Phoenix Labs is the end of one story and the beginning of another. In the past, Phoenix Labs was a venture, capped, ind venture capital backed independent studio with significant pressure to maintain a small internal headcount while still aiming high in our product goals. Post acquisition, we had the resources to invest in ourselves and we could and should scale our ambitions to match. So this is the thing we arrived at. External development should support and accelerate growth at Phoenix Labs, not replace it. And all right, so we got a pretty clear idea of our goals, what the company wants to do. We got a pretty clear idea of what kinds of problems external development is good at solving. But we should also think a little bit about what kinds of things external development is bad at solving. What should we not do with external development? And so these were the three big buckets that we came together with of things that we would not want to spend money on in external development. And this is going to be controversial, and it should be controversial because it was controversial when we talked about it, and it's still controversial now. Um, but the three big pieces are core design, strategic, strategic technology, and staffing shortages. So again, remember, outsourcing core work and headcount is effectively investing in other businesses, not Phoenix Labs. And also, please note, these are guidelines, not rules. Um, and when we choose to make exceptions, uh, the exceptions do, do exist, but they should always be treated exactly as that, exceptions. Choices that you are consciously choosing to deviate from a strategy, and that's based on due diligence, risk assessment, talking with, with your internal stakeholders, and everybody is aware that you are choosing to deviate from that strategy. Also, super clear that you are, um, it's important to uh, communicate with your stakeholders that exceptions are exactly that. They're exceptions, not precedents. And exceptions can sure look like precedents if, uh, if you're not being real clear about it. So let's talk about core design for a second. Um, this is all about the product choices that we make. And we are at core a game development company. The games we make are, that's, that is the, the, the thing that our business is for. And it is the core of our promise to our players is that when you play a Phoenix Labs game, it's designed by people at Phoenix Labs. Uh, and that's really the, the, the thing that we never want to compromise on. Um, from, a, from an XDev perspective, this means that things like full SKU development is unlikely something we'd be interested in. Um, we are much more interested in things that will support and accelerate growth, not replace it. Strategic tech. Um, so this is the kinds of technology that we develop that are going to give us a competitive advantage in the market. These are the kinds of things that we build into our games uh, that will carry forward into further games. These are the things that are, we're, we are the technology that helps us advance. Um, it's super important to, to realize that middleware uh, is an inherently risky thing. Doesn't mean we don't use it. We use lots of middleware. But every time that we do, it has a very high threshold of due diligence. Um, the thing to, to note is like, if we lose control of our products, our ability to serve our products to our players, that is like an existential risk to our company. Um, so we have to be extremely confident that the technology that goes into our games is always going to be reliable. Um, so uh, we're extra sensitive to this one. Um, I'm not sure how many folks are familiar with uh, Akinema. Um, it was an animation solving middleware piece uh, that we used on Dauntless. And we we're really careful in our contracting. We had, a, we had a provision in the contract that if a kinema ever went out of business, we had access to source code. So we were totally covered. We had high confidence in the business, but in case they, went, they, they folded, we would be fine. Except we didn't account for mergers and acquisitions. So one day, a kinema was acquired and they just stopped answering our calls. They didn't, they didn't go out of business. 
they didn't, uh, they didn't you know, stop supporting, they just went quiet. And out of nowhere, in a live service game, we had to rip that technology out and put something else back in. And that is a that is left a lasting mark on the way that we think about risk inside the studio. Um, so just keep in mind, if you are a middleware developer, realize that this is actually it's not it's not a trivial thing to incorporate another company's software into your into your products. And finally, staffing shortages. This is the big one for us, and it's really the big one for this conference. A huge number of people here. Our, their whole job is to supply excellent developers, excellent artists, excellent engineers to support other teams. And there is a real conflict potential between product goals and staffing shortages. So here's the thing. Green invest in Phoenix Labs. We want to grow. We've been told to grow. However, we also want to protect the culture of our company. We want to make sure that we are being smart about our recruiting. We're smart about hiring the right kinds of folks. And so that creates a tension where the needs of the products, we are growing teams, we have growing businesses. We're not, just, we're not just making one game, we're making a whole slate of games. We've got some really smart people who want to go fast, they want to make things, they want to make, their, make the games. At the same time, there's a recruiting team who's saying, slow down, slow down, slow down. We, could, we, we, don't, we can't hire people fast enough. And so all of a sudden, you've got, you got a state where the game has needs, the, pro the product development team has needs, the recruiting team cannot possibly keep up in terms of supplying the kinds of folks we have at the company. And all of a sudden, that seems like an ideal time to outsource. That seems like the perfect time to go to an external team. Except supplanting headcount externally has its own inherent risks. That is the definition of investing at another, in, into another company instead of our own. Because it creates challenges that are actually not always easy to see. Um, there are communication risks, there are team risks, there are sort of semi-invisible um, semi semi things like if you have a hole in, your, in your, uh, your staffing and there's an external partner that's perfect for it, if you are too fast to go outsource that, maybe you're gonna miss that as a growth opportunity for somebody inside the company. And if you're a studio that is heavily focused on growing people in their career, heavily focused on giving people a place to grow and a place where they want to work long term, you have to be more focused on giving them opportunities than you are to jump to fill it with somebody who's available outside the studio. There's also legal risks, particularly in Canada. If you treat an external contractor like they're a member of your team, very quickly you owe them vacation, you owe them benefits, because quite rightly, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck by Canadian law. So we gotta be really careful with things like that. Anyway, I'm more than happy to dig into this one, but this was a, a, a long-standing and challenging uh, concern for us. So, with all of that context, um, with we, now that we know like, what the goals were for, the, for our company post-acquisition, once we have a, know, have a good idea of what kinds of problems XDev is good at solving, have a good sense of what kinds of problems XDev is not good at solving for us, what did this actually look like? And so, <laughs> pivot in action. This uh, had sort of four broad phases in terms of each of our relationships. The first was a bit of a risk review. The second was about updating and terminating contracts. Third, offboarding uh, and relationship management. And finally, internal re-education and transition support. Again, this makes it look really neat and tidy. It's not. It's murky and gray. And this was not a linear pipeline. This was not like each of these things happened in perfect, uh, perfect sync. Um, but it is a, the way that I reflect on the kinds of changes that we are making to our external development contracts. First of all, risk review. Um, so again, we had talked about how our tolerance for risk had changed. Um, in, not only in terms of headcount, but also the risks didn't disappear. It's not as though pre-acquisition we had tons of risk and post-acquisition we had none. It's the, the risks themselves changed. The risk we now had was failing to scale, failing to deliver on a, like, on a slate of projects where it's like our goal is now to develop a slate of genre-defining AAA products. The risk there is failing to take the steps to take us there, not the risk of, oh my goodness, what happens if we run out of money? Um, so at, really, we had to then review all of our current extra practices through a, the lens of the kinds of things we're talking about here. Does it support and accelerate growth or does it undermine it? Then we're talking about uh, after, after we've done that risk review, we've got to update or terminate contracts. 
the first piece of this would be triage. We, you have to look at everything you're doing and what are the most important pieces to update and what can stay for a month or even a year. Uh, what, what is the most critical pieces to pay attention to? What's working fine? What needs attention? Also, this is really about honoring the spirit of your contracts, not necessarily the letter of them, because this is a really rough thing to do, to update, it updates the nice way, terminates the ugly one. Um, so, you know, in our contracts, I suspect are broadly similar to other folks in this room, where we had net 30 days. We could, we could go at any partner we have and with one month notice say goodbye. Um, we did not do that even once. There is not a single outsourced relationship that we, we, we ended, and we ended a few, um, on that basis. For example, we had a long-term animation partner that uh, our you know, phenomenal team, I'm perfectly happy to name them, it's a, it's a group called Steamroller, primarily out of Florida, among the best animators that you will ever work with. Uh, and I got on a very difficult call with uh, the CEO of that, of that company, and we gave them five months of notice. And not only is it about saying, here's an extra chunk of notice and this is how you can get your house in order. It was me walking him through the thought process. Why are we making this decision? Why is it important to our business? And the end result of that is we are actually much closer at the end of it than we are right now. So um, this is, it kind of feeds into this next piece, which is transparency really strengthens relationships and uncertainty undermines them. How you handle offboarding is enormously important not just in terms of being a decent person, although that's a big part of it, uh, but also we are an incredibly tiny community of developers. If there's anything that you'll notice at XDS, everybody knows everybody within a couple of years of coming here. Your reputation matters and treating other people like decent human beings uh, is not just good sense, it's just good business as well. So the final piece of this, and this is the kind of thing that's ongoing, this is a big piece of what my, me and my team are doing, it's essentially re-educating how your teams think about outsourcing uh, and then really helping them to transition uh, to new solutions. So again, start with why. Explain to them why these decisions are being made. And in doing so, you can transform thing, uh, people into allies. You can get them on board and help you pivot a strategy rather than resist that pivot. And they have an incentive to resist. You know, just because you want to change the way you outsource things doesn't mean the problems that they, they are trying to solve go away. Um, this also tells you a lot about how you want to do that triaging process, is if you want to move, say, your entire animation team from outside the studio to inside the studio, you sure as hell better have a, a plan for how you're going to uh, ramp up the internal folks and ramp down the external folks. Um, this is not the kind of thing that you want to do without a plan, and it's not the kind of thing you don't want to do, uh, do independently. And it's worth folks no noting here, particularly for people who work with other developers, XDev people have much higher context into what's going on inside the business than the dev teams do. Almost always, they are heavily focused on making great games, because that's their job. And when we talk to the product managers and the game directors and the art directors, their job is to advocate for their product. They should care more about making their game and protecting their team over your, your position of like representing a corporate interest. Um, but if you can understand what kind of problems you're good at solving, what the corporate goals are, and what you're trying to achieve, and explain it in a way that's articulate, you can bring those people on board, and now you have advocates to help you uh, pivot a strategy instead of people that are going to be resisting it. So, thing to remember, there is no such thing as good outsourcing. There's no such thing as good external development. There's only good for us at this time. Why does it matter? Well, for XDev folks, your ability to supply good solutions for your team requires you to have good context on the wider business. And why does, it, why does this matter for service providers? Well, your ability to sell services is limited by your ability to understand the dev team's needs. Um, to put this another way, um, this is not just about, you know, the dev team needs thing X and you make thing X. Um, it's about if you supply thing X, then that dev team can then go do something else. Um, it, to actually, a, a simpler way of putting that perhaps would be, um, I get why me buying things from you is good for you. Um, why is me buying things from you good for me? And then finally, I want to talk about you know, how did this all work out for Phoenix Labs? Well, north of, three, north of 300 of us. In the last two years, we've opened studios in Montreal and Los Angeles and grown the team in Vancouver and uh, San Francisco. Um, we have taken on responsibilities for publishing Free Fire and other arena games in North America and Western Europe. And we have uh, north of, uh, as I say, north, north of 300 people. And I will also say this. We have more external partners than ever before. 
we have virtually uh, tripled our outsourced budget in the short term, and that will go north very, very quickly from that from today to the next few years, we'll be doing more external development work with more partners than we ever could have uh, if we had stayed as a company before, as an independent company. So from my perspective, this acquisition was not only hugely successful for us as Phoenix Labs as a company, it's also been a huge success from an external development standpoint, and I'm thrilled to be working with so many people who are here today. And uh, from my perspective, this is what a successful acquisition looks like. In conclusion, take the time to understand your company's goals. Really understand what your team's trying to do because this is the thing that's going to let you make a good external development strategy. Be very clear about how your XDev team can advance those goals or undermine them. Uh, be very conscious that just because uh, it was working before doesn't mean it's going to keep working. Be as, tra as transparent as possible in your, in your communications, both internally and externally. Uh, and finally, be kind. We're all in this together. Be good to each other. Thanks a lot. <laughs>